It's time for another one of these. If you haven't seen one of these episodes before, they're all about interesting games that might have flown under the radar of a lot of people. I'm not going to promise that all these games are good, just that they'll have something novel and unique about them. We also try to stick to fairly recent games, because looking at the entire span of gaming history gets daunting real fast. So, here we go. Lone Survivor. One of the precious few true survival horror games to come out of the last few years. This 16-bit looking creepfest is more Silent Hill than any of the recent AAA budget games that actually bear the Silent Hill title. If you're looking for something truly mind-bending and disturbing in an ocean of action games that think they can be called horror just for having zombies, this is a must-play. Daisy. Speaking of zombies, if you're looking for a zombie apocalypse that actually plays like a zombie apocalypse and not just a run and gun, this Arma 2 mod is fantastic. It's a zombie game that's truly about survival. Much of it is focused on scavenging, because nothing is as scary as getting ambushed by zombies while searching through an abandoned shack for the food you need to get through the day. Now, Daisy still has some of Arma 2's glitches and quirkiness, but it also has the giant maps and attention to detail you'd expect from anything made off of that engine. Plus, if you already own Arma 2, it's free. So, if you're looking for a good group game or just a new take on zombies, it's certainly worth a try. A Valley Without Wind A Valley Without Wind is a procedural Metroidvania game. It's got tons of depth and effectively infinite levels to explore. Unfortunately, the control scheme's a bit counterintuitive, and the user experience in general is pretty clunky, but if you can muscle through that, there's hundreds of hours of gameplay here. Well, technically, I guess there's infinite hours of gameplay here. The Legend of Grimrock. This is one of the first games in years that has made me reach for a pen and paper. It's a throwback to the days of Ultima Underworld or Dungeon Master, but with a more modern touch. It's a first-person dungeon crawl that's as focused on puzzle solving as it is on combat. It'll get your brain cranking as you try to level and loot your way through Grimrock's many floors. For any designers out there, it's amazing the variety and depth of puzzles they're able to get out of a fairly small and easily understandable set of tools. If you're a student of design, it's worth looking at it for that alone. Avernum. As long as we're on the subject of retro RPGs, Avernum is totally worth checking out. When I first encountered this title on the PC, I found it a little bit slow given all the other faster-paced games on the platform. But when I eventually picked it up on the iPad, man, I must have dumped 40 hours into the thing. This is one of the best iPad RPGs out there. It's got a huge holistic world with an interesting storyline, compelling tactical combat, meaningful choices, though often you don't realize you're making them unless you think it through, it's not a dialogue option game, and more dungeons to explore than you can imagine. This is a fantastic use of the platform. The touch interface is perfect for this style of game, and it really shows how platform and input device can completely change an experience. If you're hankering for an old Ultima-style game with a huge world to explore, it'd be tough to find much to compete with Avernum on the iPad. Artemis. Oh man, what can I say about Artemis? Other than it is a bonkers good time. Artemis is a LAN game. Yeah, it has internet play, but trust me, play it on a LAN. It's a LAN game where each player plays the role of one of the deck officers on a starship. You got comms, engineering, science, weapons, navigation, and of course, the captain. Each person sits at their own terminal, with information and an interface that is entirely unique to them, shouting back and forth to relay information. And the best part? The captain doesn't even get a computer. All the captain gets is a monitor, and they can't even control that. They have to tell the crew what they want on the main screen. This is an amazing example of a video game where a player can have a fantastic time and be fully immersed in the experience without ever pressing a button or moving a mouse. Now, is this game still in its early stages? Yes. Is it still pretty rough around the edges? Yeah. But is it worth getting five of your friends to throw in seven bucks for a ridiculous night? Absolutely. After all, if you've ever wanted to pilot the Enterprise, this may be as close as you're going to come for quite some time.
And lastly, I was trying so hard not to put any Paradox games on the list this time. This series is quickly turning into games Paradox just released, but darn it, they have always got something interesting about them. Actually, to be honest, I can't get super into a lot of Paradox games. In fact, I think most of their games could do with a lot of usability work. But even when they fail, at least they usually manage to achieve noble failures. Misses that do something different and show us what something good might be if someone with a bigger budget and less of a niche audience ran with it. That's why they show up here so often. They might not always be great in and of themselves, but they always do something different. So, Crusader Kings 2. Crusader Kings 2 is sort of like the more personal version of Europa Universalis. If you've ever wanted a medieval grand strategy game that's more about manipulating interpersonal connections and familial rivalries than battles, Crusader Kings 2 is the game for you. It plays like a true grand strategy game. Interpersonal affairs aren't based on dialogue choices, but they're crafted out of an extensive series of stats and traits. Matching your retinue, marrying your daughter to the right person, figuring out which of your retainers can be trusted to hold a castle without deciding to elevate himself to an independent lord, it's all determined through looking at numeric systems or pithy attributes, but play it for long enough and you really feel like you get to know these people. My experience with Crusader Kings 2 had some of the richest characterization I've seen in a recent game, and none of the characters even spoke. Interestingly enough, the game also isn't focused completely on conquest. Forming a lasting dynasty is more directly the goal of the game, if there even is one, than using your best nobles to smash your way through the Holy Lands. Oh, and speaking of which, they've recently enabled playing the Crusades from the Muslim side, which is something we don't see every day in games. The game also does some beautiful Paradox-style things, like put Wikipedia links on all the historical characters, so you can find out more about all these obscure nobles bickering over Europe. And that is just great. Why don't more people do that? And... I almost don't want to bring it up because of all the meticulous attention to historical detail the creators put into the game, but... There's a Game of Thrones mod. If that doesn't push you over the edge, I don't know what will. Alright, that's it for us this time. Hope you get a kick out of some of those. We'll see you next week. But there's no sense crying over every mistake You just keep on trying till you run out of cake And the science gets done and you make a neat gun For the people who are still alive